Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by the rebel scum himself, Preston Jacobs. Preston? Scum? How dare you, sir? How <laughs> dare you? So, guys, welcome back to the sixth episode of the Game of Thrones podcast, and today we'll be discussing Game of Thrones Season 7, Episode 3. As always, we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so be sure to check us out there. Also, if you are listening to us on iTunes, be sure to leave us a review. We enjoy reading those. Now, before we begin, Preston, did you hear about the HBO hack where the thieves stole several terabytes of info? I I did hear about the hack. Mm. I did. I was a bad boy. I, 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 I read. You read the script? I read the script for next week. Yeah. Or it wasn't really a script. It was like a summary of everything. Mm. I don't know. But, uh, well, what else? Well, I, like I said, I, I, we, we, I discussed this with you a, a while ago. I hate I hate when leaks like this come out because I like to be surprised. And once again, we're gonna sound like a, I'm going to sound like a hypocrite right now because the first episode of the podcast was dedicated to these leaks. But we don't build our mm. entire channels around them. It's one of the, it's one of those leaks are like, it's like tonguing a wound inside your mouth, you know, <laughs> like you don't want to do it, but it's right there and you just yeah. find yourself doing it. That's, that's the, the thing with leaks. What am I not going to look at it? You know, like, I'm, I don't want to do it, but I'm, I'm on the internet. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Yeah. So episode three, I would say was much better than episode two. Episode two ended on a strong note. Episode three also ended on a strong note. These episodes are ending really, really good. But give me your thoughts on episode three on a scale from one to ten. So first viewing of episode three, I thought it was the best episode that we've had in a long time. I would say years. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe since since somewhere in season four. I, you know, it was really solid acting, a lot of really intense scenes. And then on my second viewing, when you take away all of those kind of surprises, then all of the things that don't make sense kind of come forward. Mm. And you're like, yes, it was a really awesome episode, but I keep thinking about all the, the kind of wasted potential, like how, how things could have been mo you know, much better. How so? Um, well, I mean, I think mainly about Sam and Jorah, and I think about you know, what they could have done with, with Jamie and Alina. I mean, obviously, Diana Rigg is awesome, and so she's going to, you know, they essentially gave her a mic and was like, okay, you know, Diana Rigg, do your thing <laughs> for five minutes, and, and, and she's awesome. Like, you right. can't. I appreciated the double fake out that they had and then but eventually when you examine it you say, Oh, that double fake out doesn't really make any sense, you know? And and then Well we'll we'll get to it, but give me your general impression. From from one to on a scale from one to ten, how did you like the episode? Was it an eight? Was it a seven? It was an eight. It was an eight. It was very it was very high. I would say best best episode of Game of Thrones in in years. Mm. The, the show is still descending into just a complete lack of utter logic. <laughs> but, but at the same time, like, I'm, you know, I'm weighing that against everything else. There was great acting. There was, there was some powerful scenes, very intense. Uh, there were some surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was thoroughly surprised by things. And, and uh, that was really, it was a fun, interesting episode. It caught my attention. But... I marked down because there's just some things that are just so ridiculous that you see them and you just laugh because you're like, <laughs> come on. I'm, I'm you know? assuming you're talking about the Casterly Rock and High Garden, how they totally look like yeah. shit castles. Well, before we get to that, uh, would you agree with me that the weakest parts about this episode was the Winterfell stuff, uh, Bran, it was just, eh, and the Sam and Jorah stuff. Completely weak, bogged it down. Yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, there's so much that could have been done with Sam and Jorah. Okay, know. let's let's go into know. it. Let's yeah. let let let's start with the Citadel. So the Citadel this time around, uh, apparently Jorah is completely cured of grayscale. He does not have any more issues. Uh, right. th this is why I said I would rather have Jorah go elsewhere. Maybe some shadow magic could have cured him, and as a result, maybe he loses feeling in his left hand. Maybe he maybe his lifespan has been cut in half. Who knows? But I I just feel as though him being cured of grayscale wasn't really earned. It just was a thing that happened, and here we go. Nothing came of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about this in my Q&A, uh, but one of the things that this missed opportunity was imagine if, rather than just him being cured, you know, the, the maester comes in the next day, finds Jorah covered in these horrible cut wounds everywhere, and he's furious, and he, and he tells Sam, like, you probably have grayscale, you're in quarantine, 
with Jora. And then the two of them are now together in that room thinking that maybe they're going to have grayscale locked together talking, mm. you know, and then, and then Sam, like, you know, one dark night could say, you know, could tell him why he came to the Citadel. Like I came to the Citadel because of this army of the dead. And he like tells this long story to Jorah. And then Jorah could say, you know, if I survive, you know, I promise you, I'm, I will, I will do everything I can to stop this army of the dead. Like that would have just been like a more intense, like heart to heart, like Sam talking about all of his hopes, all of his fears and the things he's seen like Jorah, like being emotional because he's on his deathbed. He's mm-hmm. not sure if he's going to survive. You know, the the surgery is just, you know, sapped him of all of his strength. And then, you know, they could have had, they could have been stuck together bonding. And instead, like, it's just, I don't know. It was just nothing. It was just. That was one of my complaints uh, in my review. Like, I, I, I never bought the whole, you know, Jorah and Sam getting together. I never bought that team up. But it's like you said, if you're going to have it in there, you might as well make something of it. And in my review, I kind of complained that, you know, if you're going to have these guys together, then for the love of God, do do something with them. Have, like, that bonding moment. Yeah. You know, have, have, a, have a moment where Sam tells Jorah a story about his father, how his father helped him out one time, and, you know, Jorah could do the same. Like, it's... It's a missed opportunity. Right. You're right, but shouldn't Sam have gotten like a fucking maester's chain for curing this thing, or kicked out? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, none of it really makes sense. I mean, I could see the maester saying, you know, let's. I, I just think Jorah should have been there at least one more episode. Mm-hmm. Like, have two weeks pass. Have them become friends. Have them discuss and, and, and exchange information. Like, who's Daenerys? Like, oh, she's on Dragonstone. That's where the dragon glass is. Oh, like wait, you were with my dad and you went on a long march and there were dead things and there was a mutiny and wait, my <laughs> sword was given to Jon Snow? Wait, <laughs> my my cousin is is supporting Jon Snow? She, she's a little girl? Like, all of these things could have been done. Like, it would have been, or his niece, I don't know how, how Lyanna is, is related to Jorah, but there's so, there's so many connections between Sam and Jorah that exist so many things for them to talk about and they talk about none of it you know well we got to we got to get Jorah back to Danny so he's busy not fucking her that's that's the one thing we need right, right. that's the one so thing we get, need so so he can tearfully leave her for the fourth time <laughs> you know oh my god so i, mean, I like right he's ex- he's exiled by Danny gets Tyrion comes back is exiled by Danny uh goes and saves her and then is exiled by Danny because he's got grayscale. Mm-hmm. He's gonna come back, cure it, and it's gonna leave Danny again to be part of the fellowship. I will say I love how on Sam's first attempt he goes for it and completely gets it. What are the odds of that? What are the guy? And I love I, I love his line at the end when he's uh, talking to the Archmaester. He goes, "I just followed the instructions." Son of a bitch. I mean, sur- surgery to be. To be a good surgeon involves a lot of um, ideas about risk and return and how you're going to how you're going to do something. Mm. You know, like, are you going to try to save? Are you going to try to save this organ or are you going to cut this organ out? Are you going to try? You know, are you going to do this bypass that has a certain percentage chance of working? Or are you going to risk it and do something else? I mean, there there's there's trade offs and, and gambles. And Sam does make those gambles. I mean, he says, oh, I just read the book. No, he didn't like. There's some, you know, there's some gambles in there. He, he has to decide, uh, you know, am I going to, you know, he risks getting grayscale himself. You know, there's an amount of skin that he's going to cut off, mm-hmm. you know, and if that's going to kill Jorah. I don't know. Well, actually, I guess he just didn't consider that. He's just like, oh, I'm just going to cut it all off. <laughs> but, but shouldn't he get at least one chain for that? No. No. I mean, he's been at the Citadel, I don't know. I mean, first of all, what's Ebros' specialty? I don't even know. See, he studies both history and healing. In the book, he's healing, mm-hmm. but he's also writing a book on history. So I don't know what he, what, like what a specialty is, and so which which chain he can award to Sam. Plus, if you're only good at cutting off grayscale, that doesn't mean you can just become <laughs> like a full fledged <laughs> like a healer. You got to heal at least healer. ten things before you can get a, a maester's chain. <laughs> yeah, you got to know all the subjects. That's understandable. Some people said that uh, even though uh, what's his name, Ebr- you called him Ebros. 
Yeah. Called them Ebros. Even though Ebros um, was kind of punishing Sam by uh, giving him all those things to copy down. Some people said that really, what really wasn't a punishment. It was more like a low key reward that those uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't know. Who, it was low, low key, low key plot advancement. Plot advancement. Yeah, I don't know where people got this from. I I didn't even think of this. I just thought he was just punishing Sam. But uh, maybe I'm the asshole. Do you think Ebros gave Sam some of uh, the restricted books to read as a as a reward, low key reward? Mm. No, that's too smart for the show. <laughs> I mean, I thought that. I thought that. I was like, oh, is Ebros being clever? Mm-hmm. No. No. no, he's just punishing him, and Sam is going to stumble upon something, you know, randomly. Okay, so the Citadel stuff, meh. It's just, oh, just so much wasted potential. Just, you know, you could have had some real connection between those characters, mm-hmm. you know? Like, at the end where they're shaking hands, like, I just didn't feel they, I didn't feel they shared enough together. I don't feel, you know, I didn't feel they opened up enough. Um, I hope there's a deleted scene where Sam, after he shakes his hand, goes runs into the bathroom and just scrubs his hand. <laughs> right. You know, or what would be interesting is if Sam actually gets grayscale and dies from grayscale. <laughs> after all of this. That would be cruel. Awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. But no, it's not going to happen. All right. So let's move on to Winterfell. And in the Winterfell scenes, we get uh, Peter and Sansa. Uh, he's still being a low-key creep. Just please kill him off already. He's too cringy. Sansa is proving that you know, she's okay being in charge. <laughs> Cover your fucking steel plates with leather. <laughs> Why on earth is Sansa a fucking expert on this and everybody else is, a, is sitting there you, holding their you dicks? You would think the blacksmiths just... would do this normally since they're from Winterfell. You would think that, right? It, do- it doesn't matter if they're from... It doesn't even matter if they're all from the Vale. Like, people in the Vale, like... You know, go through, like, live in the mountains and go through winter. Like, Mm -hmm. they should know this. Like, why is Santa, like, coming up with that? Whatever. Did you notice how uh, when they uh, talked about Maester Lewin's records, Peter Baelish had, like, this little look on his face? Like, "Mm?" Right. There's the question of of what could possibly be in the letters. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just don't know. I don't know what could be in them. You know, I've, I've thought about it a bit, and... Some people say, oh, it's Sansa's letter that she wrote under duress from Cersei. But I'm like, everyone knows that she was under duress. Right. Like, so what's it matter? Yeah. How, right. How can anybody use that against mm-hmm. her? I can't think of anything else that would be in there that has to do with Sansa and Littlefinger. Well, in the books, I made a point to note this down because they switched it up. But in the books, doesn't Lysa reveal right in front of Sansa that Peter had her... Uh, what was it? Poison, John Aaron's wine. Wasn't that done right in front of Sansa? It's it's subtle in the it's subtler in the show, but yeah, Sansa should know that Lysa murdered John Aaron. No, no, in the show, I made a I made a point of remembering this. In the show, the show in the books switched that up. I believe, if I recall, if, if I can recall correctly, in season four, Sansa was not in the room when Lysa revealed it. But in the books, isn't Sansa in the room and overhears it? Well, she has to be because she's a point of view character, so she overhears it, right? I I think in the show there's another scene before the moon door scene, mm. and I'm trying to remember if she's if she's talking to Sansa or if she's talking to Littlefinger. I think and where she admits that no, she that was she talking to Littlefinger that she poisoned. She uh. she specifically said that I poisoned my husband's wine, and I, I I remember myself complaining like, oh, that's not fucking subtle at all. Wow, and good good one. Um, so you're saying in the show, Sansa doesn't know that she killed John Aaron. Exactly. Um, had they just kept with the books, Sansa could have, you know, put two and two together because if you recall, Maester Lewin kept that one letter Lysa sent to Catelyn in the first episode warning her about the Lannisters. Well, did he though? So, so in the book, it would be impossible because in the book, Cat and Lysa have a secret code that only the two of them know. Mm. And Cat throws the letter in, in the fire. So even if Lewin secretly like made a copy of it, it would be in secret code and no one would know it. But in the show, um, I doubt that, that in the, there's the secret code. In, right. In the show, he brings her the letter. It's sealed. You see, we see the seal on it. She opens it, reads it, throws it in the fire. Now, it could be that Lewin, being a tricky, tricky little maester removed the seal, copied the letter, <laughs> then re- resealed it and gave it to Kat. Um, but wouldn't that be interesting, just, though? 
that's pretty crafty, but it'd be a plot hole. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it'd be very crafty of 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 Lewin to do. Mm. I'm not saying that you know, it, maesters are crafty people, but the show hasn't made maesters crafty people. Like book maesters are all sneaky. They've got conspiracies going on. They're whispering in people's ears. You're not supposed to trust them. Right. In the show, maesters are pretty straightforward guys. So I just, especially Lewin. So I, I just, I don't see that happening. Like him, him copying that letter. But there's definitely, I don't know. I, I feel like the Winterfell could have been done much better, uh, less sloppy. You want Peter Baelish to team up with uh, Bronze Jan Royce and, and Podrick. I would just want Peter to try to take the Vale forces, take over Winterfell, maybe have Sansa outmaneuver him, maybe find out his plan. Something. Yeah, you're right, because Peter Baelish is being way too fucking uh, sloppy, and it's just cringy at this point. But we get Bran back, and I made a joke how Bran kind of sounds like the HAL 9000 robot. Yeah. You're, you're Lord of Winterfell. I can't be Lord of Winterfell, and I can't be Lord of any... Like, what the fuck happened to you, dude? What are, what are you doing, Dave? <laughs> Dave, I'm scared. <laughs> It's not that it's not logical that that Bran would get to that point, but that transformation happened off screen mm-hmm. and that sucks. Because the last time we saw Bran, he was tapping into the Werewood net as a normal dude and he's standing in with Ned at the Tower of Joy looking at the events like a normal dude. Mm-hmm. And then the next time we see him, he's a robot arriving at the wall it would make more sense because right before the night king invades the uh cave the raven gives him all these like uh uh, memories and visions or whatever right it would make more sense after all that happens oh yeah he's a robot right but he was normal he was normal with uncle with uncle cold hands he was normal (laughs) at at the the tree so apparently it was that tree that did it at the tower of joy scene or something because some, you know, somewhere between that tree and and dragging the sled to the wall, uh, he he became a completely different person. I feel bad for Mira. She has nothing to do now, nothing at all. She's probably gonna come back next season with Hall and Reed. But as far as we know, Mira is completely done. I will say the one creepy thing about this, and I'm sure a lot of people have agreed, was when Bran brought up her marriage to Ramsay. Like, dude, why would you do that? Like, everybody, everybody's like, what the fuck? What the what the hell's your problem? What the hell's like, your problem? <laughs> You were pretty that you were pretty the day you were raped, the night you were raped. <laughs> what a dick. It was it was beautiful. The snow. What a dick. Uh, what the fuck? I like I said, I liked Winterfell the first two episodes. It was it was fine. We got some northern politics, a little, little, little sprinkle of it. Um but you're right. You're right about one thing. It was very crowded. I'm glad John is gone and Sansa's doing something, but like I said, it's just wasted yeah. potential. They should have Sansa try to defeat Littlefinger because for the longest time he was her mentor. And now she should try and one one up him. But he needs he needs to he needs to have a plan that's worthy of her stopping. Right. You know, like right now he seems to be saying, Okay, you need to focus on Cersei and that has you against John somehow. But I don't see how that all plays to his favor. You know, I guess he wants to get rid of John so that Sansa's in charge, so that he can marry her and be in charge. But it's just the, the stakes seem so low. He doesn't seem he doesn't seem connected. He doesn't seem to be the, the puppet master that he was before. Mm-hmm. So before we move on, any thoughts on Bran? I, I, I was just I wasn't feeling Bran this episode. I mean, the first time you and Sansa just get back together and you, you're going to mention her rape. Like, come on, dude. Fucking people skills. You're not you're not a heathen. Uh, I wasn't really feeling Bran. I wasn't uh, just, him being a robot. I don't mm, mm. John, you know the night in which Egret was shot to death before you? That was a really that was a really nice night. That was really beautiful. Did, so does Bran know everything that's ever happened? Like did he see John in the cave? And... He I mean he saw Hard Home. We we know he's seen Hard right. Home. And uh we know he we know he's seen the Fist of the First Man. Mm-hmm. And we know that he saw Sansa getting raped. And he know, we know he was at the wedding. Well, technically, technically, he didn't. I don't think he saw Sansa getting raped. All he said, all he alluded he, to, was that Sansa getting married. So, can he see things from an aerial view? He said, "I'm sorry for what happened to you." 
well, maybe that's him assuming that she got raped. I, I, I'm thinking maybe Bran can see things from an aerial view. Like, maybe there were something... F I mean, maybe there were some birds flying over because all the things he mentioned were were outside. So, maybe he didn't see John definitely going down on a wildling girl. Who knows? But he was inside the Tower of Joy. That's inside. Shut up, Preston. Shut the... F <laughs> I mean, he... No, I mean... I'm assuming everything's been seen by Bran. He's seen John going down on Egret. <laughs> He's seen C Cersei going down on Jamie. Like everything that's happened in the show, we've seen. He's seen where like that 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 guy from the internet had like someone try to like shove his finger in his butt. Like all of these scenes, <laughs> Bran has seen. I'm pretty sure. So basically, like, Bran is prime candidate to work at the NSA. Got it. So well, I'm just saying. I, I I think he's at least seen seasons one through six. Probably <laughs> seasons one through six. You're ridiculous. You got him on Blu-ray. Um, <laughs> so let's go to King's Landing. And King's Landing is one of my favorite parts this ep uh, this episode. The acting was phenomenal. I phenomenal. Ph what's this word? Please explain it. Please help me out here. Ph phenomenal. Phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> da 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 da. Uh, I love Euron. Euron. It almost sounds like Euron's gonna rape Yara, but just 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 how he was talking to her, uh, moving her through King's Landing. But but I but I love I love Euron. Euron still still uh, bullshitting with with Jamie. Any thoughts on Euron? Uh, I mean, he's he's the same the same crazy loon that he's been every episode. Loose cannon. I don't. Was he supposed to have actually gone to King's Landing and then? Got into the silence and then caught up to Grey Worm on the other side of the world. That's like around the continent. I'm, I'm assuming he was supposed to bring go attack the the Sand Snakes episode two, come back, yeah. bring them to her, and then leave immediately to go to Casterly Rock after he, I guess, had a strategy session with Cersei and Jaime, and there you go. I mean, it the scene only really makes sense if he's not captaining the silence, which I think there's a zero percent chance of that. I mean. Or if they didn't, if they didn't have the silence there, and that was like the other part of Euron's fleet, it would have made sense. But they had the silence in the scene. So what you're saying uh, is, is if they included Victarion and just had that that ship that was leading the attack on Grey Worm's fleet, if you if they had that as Victarion instead of Euron, then that would make more sense. Well, yeah. Or if just one line, Euron saying, "Oh, I've got another fleet near the Iron Islands," and. You know, that saves fleet. even more money, yet they couldn't have done that. Wow, assholes. Yeah, so Cersei and Ilaria, that's, that's like, I, we've been through this. Uh, there, there's been videos made on this topic by YouTuber Dragon Demands as to why Ilaria is always fucking mm. in this show. Uh, according to his theory, he believes that the showrunners have a hard-on for this actress. I can see why they would have a hard-on for her acting prowess. She's a very good actor. I, I, I did enjoy her. Her little, uh, her little scene there with her daughter going down. But there, there is some, uh, so there is some discussion of when the actors have no lines, they're really incredible. But when they're actually given really horrible lines, they can't do anything with them. So think of Tyene, right? Like Tyene did a great job in that scene. So when, there, but she had no lines. So it's like. Before you're giving her lines like, you know, the bad pussy and all that. And, she, and it's just ridiculous. Like, and everyone hates the Sand Snakes. But when you, when you, these are, the actors are fine. These are, these are good actors. Like the Sand Snakes are, were just given the worst material. And so it's a, I mean, the scene was just, you know, well, you had nothing, you had nothing to screw you up. You had no dialogue to screw up. I love so, how uh, Cersei, uh. Cersei takes out Tyene the same way Ilaria took out her daughter, and she just wipes it off. And then she, then the very, the very next thing she does, she goes and gives Jamie a blowjob. Every, yeah, that's everybody was tweeting ridiculous. at me. Everybody was like, "What if she didn't on. wipe it all off the way? Like, what would happen? I'm like, Jamie would be gone. You'd be blogging dead. He should have should have given him a little bit of antidote just in case, you know." <laughs> just in case who, who was a lot of people were tweeting at me that basically the same joke like Carmine even though Cersei was winning battles left and right today she was the one bending the knee I'm like ah dude come on you savages oh, by the way I love the I mean, punishment I... Cersei is dishing out to everyone in the in the in the Red Keep forcing all the women to wear the uh, that 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 Cersei hairdo 
her outfit yeah well we yeah i mean it, i i went and accounted it's at least two maybe three women have it they all have to wear the 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 uh ice skating outfit that she has the ice capades outfit poor women <laughs> why did she just grow her hair back out is she purposely keeping it short i think so uh, I guess you could say it's a little symbolic. You know, as soon as she went through that, that whole ordeal with the faith, she was reborn anew and there was no point. In well, I mean, it, it, it is a book thing. The whole the whole cutting the hair, um, stripping of femininity, mm-hmm. stripping of traditional femininity. I mean, that is a reoccurring theme. Uh, I mean, it happens with Arya and, and Danny in the second book. They both lose their hair at the same time. And that's when they, they both lose... The patriarchy, I mean, it's kind of heavy handed, actually, if you once you think about it. But like Arya's father literally dies. The patriarchy literally dies and her hair is cut. She's stripped of her femininity. Mm -hmm. She's stripped of like the whole like, you know, Ned even tells her in the first book, like you you're going to marry a lord and and be a lady and and birth all these sons. And she's like, that's not me. Well, I mean, even though Ned is a nice guy and it's benevolent, you know, sexism, it's still sexism. It's benevolent so, sexism. Like, that's, like, well, that's like the whole holding the door for women. Like, it's it's benevolent, but when you, as part of a whole system, it So it, what you're saying is, fuck them, the women can hold the doors for themselves. Yes, that's the idea, is that is that in an equal society, you know, you don't, you don't need to do these things to help out uh, women, um, you know, if once you have the equal society, you know, so... It's the uh, so, I mean, and the whole the whole story is about this. I mean, about John teaching or having the women fight and things like this, you know, which is from the book too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's the idea that if you know if, if you if you wouldn't have to protect ladies had you trained ladies to fight and protect themselves in the first place. Kind of like the, the women of Bear George Island. R. Yeah, it was the point George R. R. Martin's making. So, like, yes, in the second book, like Arya's Arya's patriarchy dies. She she's stripped of her traditional femininity, and at that point going forward, she's taking care of herself. Uh, and that's a big deal. And the same thing happens with Danny. Like her patriarchy is Caldrogo, and Caldrogo, she burns Caldrogo. She literally burns the patriarchy, mm-hmm. and um, and right after she loses her hair, she loses her traditional femininity, right. and after that, she's on her own. She's protecting herself. Um, so you think this is Cersei not growing back her hair is just her stripping off all the chains the patriarchy put on her and just this is her being her who she wants to be. Right. I mean, well, in the in a dance with dragons, like when they they mention this, they talk about how they've depowered Cersei by shaving her head and showing her naked to everyone that 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 uh, she had all of this sexual power and now the illusion's been taken away. Right. And she's, she has a shaved head and she'll never be that hot again. Mm-hmm. And so her, her, her power is gone. Her traditional agency, like Cersei's agency is, is, has been her, her sexual manipulation. And once they take that away, they think they've depowered her. In fact, Cersei is a, a bright, intelligent woman. Evil but, and crazy, but intelligent. And they didn't think about that. They underestimated her because she's, she was a woman. And so, yes, and so it's all part, like, you know, it's there. Like, she still has, like, the short hair is something from the book. It's like a reoccurring theme. It's, you could also say that it's uh, Cersei and uh, her penis envy. The, the penis envy, I mean, people use the term penis envy, but this is just the, she's, it's resentment that men have agency in this world, that she, and she doesn't. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the book in, in, the, in A Feast for Crows, like, you know, Cersei tries to do all of these things that are like Robert. It's like she, she likes, she wants to be, become Robert, right? So she, she drinks all the time, just like Robert. She tries to bang women, just like Robert. She actually, and it specifically says she doesn't like it, but she just wants to, like, do it. She wants to overpower uh, Meriwether, you know, the, the, the book only character. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so she has she has sex with women and tries to overpower them the same way that Robert would have sex. She she goes she does the same thing. Um, so it's she's attempting like, you know, she's attempting that that type of lifestyle. 
And and speaking of that, she's also kind of mirroring Tywin a little bit. Uh, one of the main things people brought up during her conversation with uh, Tycho, the Bravosi Iron Bank mm. guy, is that um, people weren't liking how uh, the Iron Bank is investing in slaves. Yeah, that was all backwards, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I will say I was okay with it. I mean, it is a major change from the books because the Iron Bank, you know, the whole city of Bravos was founded by slaves. But at the same time, the show and the book are different. I'm not one of those, you know, purist people who hate the fact that Danny doesn't have purple eyes or John's hair isn't, uh, is like a different color or whatever. I will say they're bankers. They're supposed to be shady. They're supposed to be douchey. So if they were investing in the slave trade, I'd be okay with it. But if you noticed, he never really... He Cersei just assumed, and he never really confirmed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I suppose it's it's not the end of the world. I mean, yes, it goes. They did mention that they're descendants from from freed slaves, mm-hmm. um, and so it's weird that they invest in in slavery. But at the same time, especially over the course of four hundred years, people can be hypocrites, right? You know? Freed slaves eventually like investing in the slave trade, like that would happen in our world. So probably has too. Yeah, so it's it's not the end of the world, no. It's just yeah, to be fair, Tycho never really confirmed that the Iron Bank was investing in slaves. He just let Cersei continue to assume that. Yeah, but it was also such an easy thing to not have. Like she could have just said, "Oh, you guys are descent, you know, you guys are descended from slaves, and you don't like dragons. Like Danny has dragons, you should support me." Like she could have come up with a completely different argument, mm-hmm. but they went with the slavery one. Um, well, I do like the the argument Cersei did come up with that uh, Danny's not a monarch; she's a revolutionary. Yeah, I don't know. I was okay with it. Try to, it's fine. It's fine. So the Cersei King's Landing stuff. How do you feel about it overall? It was pretty good. Could have been better in some places. I mean, or, eh. it it was fine. I mean, I'm fairly impressed that, like, I'd written off the the Iron Bank plot, and I was just like, they're never gonna resolve that. Dropped plot. So I I was. I was so impressed that they had actually brought it back that I that I forgave everything. I was like, oh gosh, you're actually going to resolve this plot. Th- th- gonna... This is something that happened, I believe, in season four when Tywin is conversing with Jaime and I think Cersei as well, telling them that the gold mines of Casterly Rock have dried up and the Iron Bank wants their due. Right. I mean, it, it actually goes back all the way to season one with Littlefinger. Oh. Littlefinger mentions that the... Um, that the crown is in debt to the, you know, to the... Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it, it adds up. You know, and I wish they would have mentioned it more. Like, what they could have had in, in which would have made the the um, Jamie's abandonment of Casterly Rock more clever is that Jamie and Cersei know that the Lannisters are, are out of gold. Tyrion doesn't. Mm. And so it would have been clever that Tyrion thinks he's going to get all, and they sh- you know, I wish they would have mentioned this. This would have been part of it. That Tyrion's like, we get their gold, we bankrupt, we bankrupt House Lannister, and then you find out that actually there is no gold in Casterly Rock, and Tyrion took a useless castle. Like, I wish they would have played that up. <laughs> that that Cersei and Jaime had better information. Tyrion's the idiot, the idiot, you know. Well, I, I was thinking about your, your argument that Tyrion is a, is a terrible general, which he is. And He's horrible. It's it's funny how they left. They they don't pay attention to the the only real commander. I mean, Tyrion has commanded men into battle once during the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Yet Yara has probably commanded men into battle multiple times. Yet nobody's really paying attention to her. Oh, she was she was definitely the. I mean, and she was right. I mean, she had the best plan. Mm-hmm. They also left behind <laughs> Dario too, and Dario could have added so much. Oh my God! To the You're so right. Oh my God! He would have he would have instantly like I couldn't imagine, you know, him Dario saying like, "Oh yeah, let's save lives." <laughs> he would have taken Danny to bed and and convinced her in bed like over pillow talk. You know, I don't mean like convinced her like he would have done such, something sexual. I'm saying like the last time he convinced her of something it was it was pillow talk. You know, they're in bed together, and he's like, yeah, you should open those uh, those fighting pits, you know? Let's let's also, uh, while they're on the topic of this, the Casterly Rock, let's discuss the uh, the uh, assaults on Casterly Rock and the Siege of Highgarden. So, off the mm. bat, let's just get this out of the way. Casterly Rock fucking okay. looks awful. Highgarden, even more so. What the fuck happened? I mean, they honestly yeah. didn't have the budget for that? Get the fuck out of here. 
It's I mean, some a lot of people were saying like one, it's called Casterly Rock, not Casterly Castle. <laughs> and <laughs> I heard that from several places. Um, another one was was why is House Tarly? Why is Horn Hill like so much better looking? Oh than God, yeah. High Garden? Horn Hill looks like some kind of like Greek, Greek like uh, uh, what's it? What's it called Pantheon? Yeah. Like wh- why? Why the fuck is 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 High Garden just like three towers behind a couple of trees? Right, and like where are the bannermen? Um, now, and this is completely unintentional. Like what they've done in the show, like because. How, and I want to talk about Jamie, actually. Can we talk a lot about Jamie and, like, his entire arc, like, throughout the entire show? Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Like, every scene, they, they try to make Jamie look like this little, like, this dumbass who's just, that is getting talked down to by, by Cersei. The who's, High Sparrow who's, talked down to him. The High Sparrow, that he's getting tricked right and left. Jamie, unintentionally is the smartest person in the in the whole freaking story. <laughs> and he's he's the best diplomat, he's the best general. Like I don't under like yeah, he loses sometimes, but it's completely understandable. Like since season 5, right? He goes down to Dorne to stop a war and get Marcella back, mm-hmm. right? He successfully talks to Doran, gets Marcella back, convinces Doran to actually send Tristane to King's Landing, securing the Dornish Alliance, like, you know, well and good. Incredible job, really. Now, granted, Alaria, like, out of nowhere, murders her entire family, mm-hmm. and no no one could have seen that coming. Right. But Jamie did, you know, he did what he could. Then, season six, he, he takes back the Riverlands through diplomacy. Like, you know, great job. And then in here, he wins this huge decisive battle, by 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 well he convinces Randall Tarley to switch sides and then takes Highgarden. So I mean Jamie has just uh he's really kept everything together. But of course he was uh, removed from King's Landing cuz something needs that something needs to happen in King's Landing. Every time Jamie is not there with his sister, something bad happens. Yet last season I I have to I have to I have to argue against this. The second half of last season was him doing stuff. The first half he did nothing. He 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 was completely useless. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what he did before he went to the Riverlands. He, the so he was in the sept. Uh, the High Sparrow talked shit to him. He kind of got annoyed, but oh, then the High Sparrow words. had his cronies around, and he, then he marched the Tyrell mm-hmm. army, and then he was uh, preempted because Tommen declared that the the faith and the crown were equal or something. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, that was a really weird. Plot. So you're right. Jamie is probably one of the not only the smartest character, he's probably one of the best characters in the show, more so than uh, Jon Snow. And well, that's what I'm that, that's what I'm saying. Like like unintentionally, unintentionally, Jamie Lannister has proven himself the best ruler by far. He should be, according to what like events have happened and who would be a great ruler, Jamie. <clears throat> is is the best one. Yeah, but we don't want a sister fucker in the fuck on the throne. Get out of here. It's... Right, and I understand he threw a child he threw a child from a window. And, now, hey but, now, come on, not everybody's perfect. Stop it. But if but if we're really talking about mixing both like having having a a, a decent uh heart for the people, like wouldn't wouldn't like torture them, and having competency, I I think I I'd, I'd argue that Jamie Lannister is the best choice. But uh, the whole siege of Highgarden was bullshit. I mean, okay, Castle Rock looked like crap, but at least the battle to take Castle Rock was not bad. The whole thing with the Iron Fleet coming from behind and uh, trapping them in the Western lands, mm. that was all cool. I did enjoy the fighting to take it, you know, inside. Grey Worm was badass. Uh, I love, I don't know why, I just got some amusement out of it. I, I love when he says, Where are the Lannisters? Where are the Lannisters? I should say that. But, um, I, I gotta s- I was expecting him to die. Yeah? I was really expecting him to he's die. He's not gonna die. I think he should have. No, he's, he's gonna be the new, uh, he's gonna be the new, uh, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Damn, why do you want Grey Worm to die so much? You, you don't trust the show I'm not just... to include more sex scenes between him and Missandei? 
No, I mean it's just it it would have it would have made the the battle more devastating. Mm. And Danny's scenes are super crowded. Well, so a lot of Unsullied did fucking die. Like they, I want to say they lost at least like a good one third of their their forces. Yeah, yeah. I mean the the, the sons of the harpy really fucked them up when they were a marine. So how how many men did they start with? Um, I mean it should be something like five thousand. No, right? no, they 10, they started with. Uh, 10,000 Unsullied or 8,000? I don't remember. It was it was an incomplete number, right? Because, like, one of the, the the battalions was being trained or something. So it might have been, like, 8,000. And, and, and she left some of them in, back in Astapor. Whatever. Um, so let's just say by the time Danny takes Marine, she has 8,000. When she leaves Marine, she probably has, like, at least 7,500. I want to say the Sons of Harpy took out quite a number of them. So right now, she should have maybe 4,000 Unsullied after the Battle of Castle Rock, give or take. Because they, cause they yeah, did okay. lose a lot of men, and most of the, uh, the Lannister forces were not there. But then we cut to Highgarden. How many men do you need for a siege? Because there were not, like, over 2,000 Lannister forces on the ground. Like, I want someone to actually go back to this episode. And, I mean, and they literally up. said that, that they took a 10,000-person... You know, they took Castle Rock's ten thousand person compliment. So like, Jamie should have ten thousand people, which would not be enough to take down the Tyrells. The Tyrells like are supposed to have like eighty thousand men or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, to be fair, when Renly said like, I think Renly was the one that said that he had over a hundred thousand men. Uh, to be yeah. fair, he had some of the uh, Storm Lords with him. So even if and the Stormlands don't have that many people, so let's say the Tyrells have seventy thousand. <laughs> let's just say I'll, I'll i'll go as low as 40 but like tyrell sh- like should have won they should I mean, they got forty thousand. they have forty thousand people and they're in the stronger position they have the castle exactly not only that though but have you noticed that in the books i think the tyrell forces clash with rob's army at one point uh yeah mm-hmm. they, they crush him at dusk exactly yeah. so the tyrells have never engaged in a in in, in any conflict in the show. The only battle they were ever in was the uh, Battle of uh, Blackwater Bay, but all they really did was assist the Lannister forces. Well, I mean, that's the thing, is like, is this idea that they, that somehow they were second fiddle. I mean, they were need, I mean, if I'm going just show continuity, we know that the army has to be big enough to be needed for the Blackwater. We know that they somehow, that, that they were big enough that they felt like they needed to have an like a pretty much an equal alliance for, you know, several seasons. So like, it's it's there. I mean, we even saw we saw the like a Tyrell army like go to the Sept. That was with, that was like Jamie. a battalion of men, maybe like a like a like a like a like a couple hundred guys. I would argue doesn't matter. Two two hundred guys inside a castle are worth uh you know. <laughs> regardless, t- you regardless. Know, t- let's let's say they have forty thousand men. You're right. It's a numbers game. They would still have held out long enough. This is the reach. They probably have a lot of food. They could have held out longer than River Run. Not only that, though, but like I said, other than the Blackwater Bay, the Tyrell army has not really engaged in a lot of combat. They should have a majority of their forces, and th- that did not look like ten thousand men. To oh, me. you're saying you're saying not engaged in combat as a good thing. Yeah, as a good like, thing. So, like, cause cause Elena, Elena's like, oh, fighting us just in our. Wasn't our Which thing. Which is I was like, oh, bullshit. That's, dumbest, that's stupid. Dumbest line. That's because one, one, even if the Tyrells specifically were were a bunch of pansies because of their sigil, mm. like there are other houses who would be martial people. Like, you know, like there's no know, way they the relied on. Uh, there's just no fucking way they relied on uh, the House Tarly to do like most of like the general work. There's just no way. Even even House Tarly. There were have no there were no Tarly banners. There were no Tarly. No, no one dressed up like a Tarly. No, not a single Tarly banner. Like that's how lazy the show was. They couldn't even they couldn't even put up a Tarly banner. <laughs> I noticed that. Like though. it would have been a little more believable had you at least one other banner banner than than a Lannister banner. If you've never read the books, you're possibly thinking that the North is the only is the only region in Westeros that has like bannermen, because. Everybody else has maybe one or two other bannermen, like uh, like uh, House Tyrell has the Tarleys, House, oh the Stormlands have Tarth, uh, mm-hmm. Lannister has 
Clegane, but like the North has like five fucking houses who swore an allegiance, who swore allegiance to them, and right. it, it just seems empty. It really just seems empty, and it seems shallow. And like I said, the Lannister forces that we saw in, in, uh, for that siege, it, it looked like two thousand guys, maybe. It it was yeah. It looking back, it was just it was cheap to have such an incredibly important battle be off screen. Mm. I don't actually. I don't mind that it was off screen, but I I did want some level of you know making it look epic. I reminded of this one episode of South Park where uh, uh, Kenny has a PSP and then he dies because mm. Heaven needs his PSP skills to lead the battle. Right, right. You seen that episode? And and yeah, and Japanese people don't have souls, so they don't have anybody else. <laughs> so so, yeah. so like the entire battle there is done off screen with the one of the angels narrating. Oh, this is twice as awesome as the last final battle of Lord of the Rings. But they, they play it as a joke, mm. though. I mean, it, w- it wouldn't have taken much. You could have just had some f- some quick cuts of people fighting. Like, real quick cuts. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, and, I, and then we could have just assumed it we're happened. We're not expecting, like, Battle of Blackwater Bay or Battle of Bastards type level of detail, but, you know, some quick cuts. I would be okay. That's the only... Pl- that's the only area I would have liked quick cuts. But rather than having a shit montage, have a quick cut montage. <laughs> And rather than it being like, rather than like saying, oh, you guys are just shitty fighters, just been like, well, we had Randall Tarley and he knew like, he knew everything you guys were going to do. That's another thing. If you're going to take High if you're going to take High Garden, fine. Show, show that the Tyro forces have a lot of men and it would be suicide with this. The Lannisters don't have enough men, even though they've been fighting Rob and Stannis, they're, they're battle tested. Fine. They still don't have enough men to take High Garden. Then have the reason Jamie went for Randall Tarley because Randall knows the layout of High Garden and he knows where to attack. Right. Would have been perfect. I mean, you established you had this big scene that oh, you're the best general. Okay, then why was Jamie leading the forces? And you know, it didn't even didn't even matter. It seemed like it was Jamie's clever plan. Had you know, had they had he just said, well, Randall Tarley had told me this. Like Randall Tarley knew your castle. Mm-hmm. Like. Then you would have brought the plot together, <laughs> or just or sewn a bunch of other banners and said like, "Oh, we rallied these banners because we saw Cersei rallying exactly. banners." Exactly. It's, it's just you. They spent all this time reading season one scripts and, and rewatching season one. Like, fucking know what you did in this season. Like, oh, it's just so frustrating. Like this is this is why. This is why after watching it the first time, I was like, oh, and then watching it the second time, I'm like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. And, and, and this is my one issue with the show is that they only they only beef up the North. The North has all these houses sworn to them, yet every other right. region barely has any other house. Any Anything that anything that makes Jon Snow's dick look bigger. <laughs> I mean, look, Stannis' battle is pretty much off screen too, right? But if it's Jon Snow, we've got to have him like buried in a pile of bodies. Burying a pile of bodies, you know, taking out the bad guy with his bare fists. Going to hard home, going to going to the Craster's Keep to fight to fight freaking club footed Carl. Fucking got so much more time. The fact that like John's battle with club footed Carl got so much more screen time than the fall of Highgarden. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, Preston. In 50 years, when they reboot this, it'll be better, hopefully. It's just, it's just so important. It's so important to show club-footed Carl. But I think I think one of the greatest scenes is uh, Olena. She went out like a boss. We got to give props to her. Uh, Jamie, Jamie, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're all right. Jamie was, was great. He, he's him saying nothing, looking at her, getting all fucking pissed off. Well, we were discussing, um, uh, I was looking through my comments, and, and people were discussing whether or not... Jamie should tell Cersei what Olena said. Well, he should. I mean, he, like, like this was also a question uh, someone asked me. Like, do you think if Jamie tells Cersei that hey, Tyrion didn't kill Joffrey, would she forgive Joffrey? No, he still killed Tywin. That's still a thing. People keep forgetting that. That's the thing. Yeah. He's, he he still killed. Well, first of all, Jamie already told Cersei that that Tyrion didn't do it. I mean, granted, she doesn't believe. She may not believe mm-hmm. him, but. Jamie went and talked, like, in the show, Jamie talked to Tyrion all the time. Very different from the book, where, where Jamie steered clear of Tyrion. But, um, 
yeah, he talked to Tyrion all the time and he went to Cersei and he said, like, he didn't do it. He said he didn't do it. Um, but he, yeah, he, he still killed Tywin. He so. still killed Tywin and Cersei still blames Tyrion for killing their mom. Not only that, but Elena is a part of Danny's uh, allies, just like Tyrion is. So, oh, so Tyrion didn't kill Joffrey? So he just conspired with Elena to have Joffrey killed. Got it. So it doesn't it doesn't right. matter. So you you teamed up with a woman that killed my daughter, like whatever whatever you you say you can't you can't undo all that. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> so, so so Jamie and Elena uh, Elena best part of the episode would you say? Uh, yeah, Definitely. yeah. I mean, look, Di- Diane Rigg is is. A fucking professional. This isn't this isn't her fucking first rodeo, <laughs> you know. She's been Tracy Bond. She was she was in the Avengers, um, the first Avengers, <laughs> you know. The uh, she uh, she's she's been everywhere. She she knows how to act. She knows how to f- freaking carry a scene. You could give her anything, and she's gonna look awesome. And so and they let her do it, and she did it. You know, it was, she aced she aced the scene. Even though some of the dialogue was shitty. Do you think some of the di- dialogue but, was shitty? Like, what was shitty about it? Well, the whole... Th- well, like I said, the thing about uh, the roses... Oh, being, right. Being not Fighting's on our forte. She re- mm-hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the speech was a little repetitive, too. Um, you know, she went on a little bit about... A little too long about how bad Cersei is and stuff like that. When she could have been... She could have just, you know, talked about general stuff, about her own life. You know. But I will say, I'm surprised that she didn't give up Peter Baelish. Because Peter and her conspired for it, to kill Joffrey. Yeah, yeah. That was weird. I, I don't know why she didn't give up Peter Baelish, but... Yeah, but, I mean, I guess Littlefinger's on an opposing side, though, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, have, haven't they written off Littlefinger because he's hanging with the Northerners? He's with Sansa right now. They want to kill Littlefinger anyway. Yeah, you, you, like we, we we've we've gone through this ad nauseum, but they want to kill Littlefinger. Whenever whenever the show wants to kill anybody at all, they'll either give them nothing to do or keep them quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I I think I think Littlefinger at this point is a enemy to Cersei, and he can't do anything about it. So. But let's talk about uh, the. The big thing this episode, John and Danny finally meeting, the meeting of ice and fire. I, I gotta say, mm. <laughs> not fucking subtle. Not fucking subtle, Dave and Dan. Uh, well, uh, I'm not a, oh, I'm right. not a stock. What the fuck was that? <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not fucking subtle at all. Um, I will say I did like the uh, the the first. I, I, the meeting was okay. It wasn't too much fan fiction. It, 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 they did it fine. It went on. It went on and on. Um, it was, I mean, considering that neither, like, well, I don't want to say that neither Kit Harrington nor Amelia Clark can act because in other stuff, they're fine. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me just stop you right there. Amelia Clark sucks. She just, if you saw her in Terminator Genesis, she just, she just blows. I saw Terminator Genesis. Yeah, she mm. wasn't great. I'm not saying neither of them, neither of them are strong actors. Um, they're not scene stealers. No, but uh, you know what I I think. Given bad material, they're even worse. They've been given the worst material, so they were they they did they were a little less cardboard than <clears throat> the normal, you know, the little you know, but <clears throat> I don't know. They still weren't <clears throat> they weren't great because you know there's only so much they can do. Um, they have no sexual chemistry. Uh, what was the thing you said to me on Facebook of, uh, from uh, who was that again? Uh, you thought it was Sam and who? Oh, Sam and from, Diane. From uh, Cheers, right? From uh-huh. Cheers, yeah. <laughs> they tried to have that, but actually Sam and Diane had sexual chemistry out the wazoo. That's like the definition of like you know, um, you know, sexual tension is Sam and Diane. That's, that's, that's what I but, said. I don't want them to get together. I want John to, if he's gonna live, I want him to marry some random background extra. Like you know, he's not that important that he needs to be fucking the uh, mother of dragons. Like we've we've given him enough know, things to do. Stop it. You already know that they're gonna fuck. They're gonna fuck, and he's gonna be like, uh, he's gonna be like, oh, I kneel to you after all. You know, and, and she's like, "No, I kneel to you." Ah. You know, something lame. It's gonna ah. just be horrible. It's gonna be horrible. <laughs> you know it. You know that they're gonna like 
fall in love and care about each other. Oh no, is John hurt? What what happened? <laughs> no, did he come back with the? <laughs> you know that the. Uh, God, it's gonna be horrible. You're a motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be horrible. Well, I I will say I did like how the meeting started off. Uh, Masande giving off all her titles and and Davos coming. Yeah, this is Jon Snow. Uh, he's king in the north. That's it. <laughs> but he, but he could have. I mean, like first of all, like why, did, like shouldn't he have had more titles being rattled off? Shouldn't he have brought his banner? I mean, what are his titles? I mean, he's wildling liberation leader. I guess you could say he's uh. Bastard of Winterfell? I... I mean, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Oh, ex-Lord Commander. Uh, uh-huh. Um, he is uh, King of the North. King of the North. Okay, we he have is... King of the North. What else do we have? Um, the He's probably, you know, you could say King Beyond the Wall, too. He, he's the, the uniter of the Wild Oh, Wings. yeah, good shit. King of the North and... King, King of the North and Beyond the Wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um... He is uh, he's a killer of, of White Walkers, slayer of slayer of White Walkers. White Walker Slayer, right? Resurrected. You could mention that he's resur- resurrected. The re the reborn, the the resurrect uh huh. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people are talking about why he's kept the, why he's kept that a secret. But um, why why why, yeah, why, why keep it a secret? Like obviously Cause, because he already ha- he already has a crazy he already has a crazy story. <laughs> we don't want want to crazy it up even more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you're talking about the water, he's already talking about the water making the frogs gay. So it's not, he doesn't want to add any more. No more craziness to it. But the whole the whole yeah. Danny John thing. I mean, what was the thing you were telling me um, about J- uh, Tyrion offering John sexual favors? What the fuck was that about? <laughs> so later Tyrion, like, <laughs> fairly unprompted. He goes to John. And John's brooding over the cliff, mm-hmm. remember? And he says, he says, um, is there anything that I can do for you? You know, and, 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 you know, Kit Harrington's like, what? What are you talking about? And Tyrion's like, why are you so dumb? Like, what can I do for you? You know, and, and of course, like, it's almost like he's begging the script to bring up the dragon glass and the dragon glass was brought up, but Tyrion didn't know about the dragon glass. So when John arrived, I think the assumption was I want forces and dragons to go kill the white walkers. So I don't know what else he could offer John. So it's weird that he's sitting there going, what else can I offer you? Which made it sound like, I'm offering, like, I'm being, a, you know, I'm trying to offer you a sexual favor or something, you know? Because imagine, I mean, imagine if the were imagine if you did that scene again, but, it, but Tyrion was like an, a, like a woman. Like, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you would have, you would have definitely taken it as, is there anything I can do for you? Like you, you would have immediately gone to that place. Right. Um, You're not wrong. You're not because wrong. It's, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, but because it's like, you know, it's it's same sex and maybe because he's a dwarf, <laughs> like you don't automatically go there. Oh, but God. The, the script is written quite poorly. Like no one would go to somebody and, and, and say, is there anything I can do for you? And he's like, what are you talking about? Anything? Like... What about oh. the uh, one one of the scenes that really shocked me, and and uh, you and I went back and forth on Twitter a little bit about it. Melisandre telling Varys that she's gonna die. Like I don't want Varys to die. I like Varys. He's a he's a he's a nice little addition to Danny's uh, uh, party. Some, someone else pointed out to me that Var- 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 Varys has spent like thirty years in in Westeros. You know, like twenty years in Westeros. Like, yeah, he's probably gonna die there. Like that's really not that big of a reveal. Right. Yeah, but the way she like says it, put... like the way she says it, it's like he's gonna die yeah. next season. Right, and yeah, he is. What? But... <laughs> Why are you saying that? Do you know something I don't know? Everybody's gonna die next Aww, season. Ah, stop it! Come you know on. who won't die next season? Um, are you, Danny? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Danny won't die next season. Uh, Arya won't die next season. I guarantee you, she's not gonna it's die. Be fucking Danny. It'll be Danny and Maisie Williams on a fucking pile of bones. 
I, I say that because like you're waiting for for Maisie Williams to go down. You're waiting for the showrunners to to come and give you that shock you've been waiting for ever since season four. It's never gonna happen. <laughs> it's making and, and the thing is, I and I have no I have no problem with Maisie hmm. Williams, but like it's made me hate her. Like the the amount of plot armor she has, like she has the like okay. John plot armor and Danny plot armor is pretty crazy, but for some reason, like I expect mm-hmm. it because they're the main characters, right. right, from the beginning. But Arya is this other tangential one, you know, and she's got such plot armor that I'm just like, oh god, like, just kill her, just kill her off. Well, what's the worst thing that could happen to her besides her dying, her being completely broken and forever fucked up? Okay, <laughs> so the the Danny John stuff. Do you have any like complaints about it? I thought it was all right. I thought it was done fairly okay. It wasn't a lot of it wasn't a lot of uh, showrunner fanfic. It was it was all right. It, it, I, what I expected. It was just, it was, that's the thing. It was what everybody expected, mm-hmm. right? They're going to hate each other at first, and then they're going to love each other. It's just like every other, you know, every other screen romance. Nothing interesting about it. One, I, one yeah. thing one thing I, I found so fucking weird watching uh, this one movie called um, called Blade with uh, Wesley Snipes. He's a uh, vampire mm. hunter who's also a vampire. At the end of the first Blade mm. movie, he and the female lead are both walking... Uh, up the stairs and they come out on top of the building and uh yeah and there's no kiss they just walk away as friends and i was like hmm, okay that's that's new i'm that's what i kind of want to happen with john and danny i don't want them to get together after like and i have to say with blade that's a whole that's a whole like movie of sexual tension between them <laughs> which is kind of funny <laughs> But, like, I don't want Danny and John to hook up because you expect that. You want it to happen. Some asshole in his basement has been writing about Danny and John getting together for the past seven fucking years. Do mm-hmm. something different. Uh, do you think George would actually write in the books John and Danny getting together? Uh, no. I, I, I don't know. It's it's odd. I mean, I guess he might do it because of the ironic incest aspect. Mm-hmm. Oh no, they're fucking. But it's not even that incestuous. It might actually be fine in in their time because cousins are fine, right? That's not incest. Really? Um, okay. I, I I didn't know that. I thought it was. Well, here's the thing. Did you know that in a majority of global cultures. Not a majority of people, but a majority of global cultures, if you like isolate like little societies and you count mm. them as a, as a distinct culture, uh, cousin marriage is fine. And, and uh, historically, cousin marriage has always been around, like still very common in, in the Middle East. Uh, and, and it's just, you know, it's a way to keep wealth in the family. In fact, they would call it, they would do actually something called cross cousin marriage as well, where the cousins would have kids and then the, the next generations of cousins would have kids and the wealth would be kept in the, in the families. Um, and so, yeah, this is why cousin marriages happen. I mean, Tywin was married to his cousin, so it's not, uh, you know, a lot about this. It's not unco- well, I mean, any, I, I guarantee you take any American today and you go back 200 years, you're going to see some cousin marriages. But like, yeah. like I, I don't know. I, I just really don't want to see them get together. It's it's something everybody's been expecting. It's someone everybody. Wa- it's something everybody wants. And I think Game of Thrones works best when they do stuff nobody wants. Like nobody wanted Rob and Kaplan to die. Nobody wanted Ned Stark to go down. But they went down. The story right. went in a nice a nice way because of it. Nobody wanted Arya to uh, be uh, you know a, a dead, un uh, un no personality girl whatever you want to call her just just uninteresting i i don't think she's as interesting anymore but no no one wanted danny and dario to get, getting together and they did which is you know which is fun really nobody wanted Dan- danny what... and dario to get together i mean not in the book people hate that romance in the really? book really oh god cuz dario's so annoying and gross <laughs> so the whole danny and john thing your overall thoughts i thought it was all right um it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just whatever. Fine. They had the right amount of like, uh, they had the right amount of uh, history being exchanged. They had a right amount of like, you bend the knee. No, I don't need to. You, blah, blah. like they had, a, they had the right amount of that. 
Um, Tyrion and Davos both came in at the right amount of time. I, I thought it was fine. It's what I expected to happen. But you're telling me that's not necessarily a good thing. Right. I mean, that's the thing is there's there's and I guess the reason the reason I really liked this episode and I, you know, on the on the first watch through mm -hmm. was the fact that there was a bit of unexpectedness at the end. Like they surprised us with the with the bait and switch, um, you know, of, of losing Casterly Rock. Mm -hmm. I mean, winning Casterly Rock, but in a sense losing. Um, and th that's what we want is we want a little more unexpectedness in the, in the story. Right. Everything is just kind of expected like we kind of knew that danny needed to be depowered but you know it was a little fun that they had the little unexpected uh switch there and so we know that john and danny are gonna fucking fuck and so it's just they're gonna fucking fuck anything yeah they're gonna fucking fuck <laughs> so like for anything else to happen like like imagine if gendry comes back and she just gets together with gendry like that would be that so would much be, more that interesting would be funny. You'd be like, that would be funny you'd be like where did that come from you know or john like seduces miss sandy and she forgets about gray worm and then gray worm comes back and there's like this tension between john and gray worm like out of left field you'd be like yeah that's something uh I just want to be surprised. <laughs> you're sounding, you're wanna, sounding like wanna, an old uh, battered wife who's uh, been in this relationship for thirty years. And... I wanna, I wanna, I wanna feel something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, we we, we briefly we, we briefly got Theon. Uh, one of one of your uh, one of the people in your comment section in your latest video, they comment how uh, what do they say? They said something along the lines of. Um, where is it? Theon is cursed. He swore to every god that he'd kill that fucking hornblower, and now he's paying the price. <laughs> I mean, I think every single person on the planet agrees that Theon did nothing wrong <laughs> uh -oh. on that ship. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, right? the ship. Yeah, yeah, no. He, what was he supposed to do? No, no. In general, yeah, no. Theon's done plenty yeah, wrong. Yeah, no. But, no, but on that ship, what the fuck was he supposed to do? Run, run towards what the was guy. He supposed to like, do? He, no, he's getting he's getting like criticized by a bunch of other Ironborn that ran away. Like, oh, you ran, you ran away. You ran away too, motherfucker. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> Jesus. All right, so... Uh, Fuck so, you, fucking So, hypocrites. Preston, this episode, you would give it an eight. I would give it an eight. I mean, I talked a lot of trash about it, but it, I give it an eight because it's it's the best episode we have seen in a long freaking mm -hmm. time. Like I said, my, it would have been a um, ten had they just given uh, Sam and Jorah more to do. Uh, had had Winterfell not have been so, mm. yeah. I mean, you could have you could have just tried harder and and you know had they had they put the time and intensity of of what they did with Cersei and Alaria and made that that kind of intensity with with Jora and Sam. And and I don't mean like them poisoning each other and things like that, but like l you know lives on the line, you know intensity like backstory mm -hmm. like. Could have just been anything. Sam talking about his, talking about a, a scene with, you know, how about like Sam and Jorah talking about their dads? Like that would be that would have been something. Like what was your dad like? What was your dad like? You know, or like oh we might we might both die. Like what do you what do you want to like? Let, they could have talked about love. They could have talked about Gilly, and they could have talked about Danny and why they loved you know the love the women they do. They they could have talked about family they could have talked about Gior. they could have talked about Jon snow they could have talked about long claw they could have talked about so many things well um and made a really intense well discussion. we know we know Jor's gonna end up getting back uh to dragonstone with danny so the long claw conversation if john is still there is gonna come up so this could have been like a like nice little precursor to that conversation with long claw yeah but you know the long claw conversation is gonna be like two seconds long <laughs> You want the sword back? No, you can keep it. <laughs> All right, Preston. Uh, All right, checklist. That's done. We, should we wrap it up now? <laughs> uh, sure, sure. Okay, guys. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as always, we are available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so remember to check us out there. Follow either myself or Preston on Twitter for all updates on the next episode of the podcast. Oh, oh, right. So should we tell the audience about our bet? Oh, but but Twitter followers. <laughs> so so Preston, I've noticed that I was talking to Preston the other day. I noticed that uh, he's been gaining uh, more Twitter followers lately, 
And uh, we just we just made this bet for fun. Oh, watch me say this, and you're gonna get like fucking, because you have a hundred thousand. Watch you get like a hundred thousand. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> Watch it happen now. <laughs> so me and Preston have this bet uh, that uh, he will, that I will surpass, well, he won't surpass me. If he surpasses me by the time this season is over in Twitter followers, I owe him 50 bucks. I mean, how many Twitter followers do you uh, have? I think I have uh, 6,000 something. Oh, really? Okay, okay. I thought it was, I thought it was more. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, <laughs> asshole. Uh, how much, wait, how many, you have uh, around 2,000 something, right? Two thousand. Yeah, so right. you have uh, two thousand four hundred. So if you surpass me by the end of this season, then I owe you fifty bucks. Watch everybody listening to this right now on your channel. They're like, "Hmm, really? You get fifty thousand followers tomorrow?" Oh my! No, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking that more people are going to be like, "That sounds so contrived." <laughs> like those motherfuckers just want Twitter followers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, like seriously, like all the time, Carmine is like, "Dude, you're not on fucking Instagram." Dude, your Twitter you you just don't use your Twitter enough. You don't. Dude, Come you gotta, on, you, you gotta, gotta like, tweet with interact your fans. On Facebook. Get in there. You gotta get in there, don't, man. Don't listen to him, guys. This fucking guy never checks anything. In fact, the other day he went on his email. Uh, he found a, an invitation to the season four premiere. Like he doesn't check shit. He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't check anything. But uh, this is a bet we have ongoing. So uh, help Preston out, help a brother out, and uh, get him up there. But uh, guys, once again, thank you so much for watching us. We will we will see you guys on the next episode. Baba Booey.